while we sometimes say, especially in my country, sometimes say we have a global economic crisis, it's not quite true. The crisis is largely in the high income world, and for much of the developing countries, the economic dynamics are quite significant and positive. 2012 and 2013 will be another year in which a basic characteristic of the world will hold true, and that is that the developing countries will significantly outpace the high-income countries in overall economic growth. And where the real crisis, if one wants to use that term, meaning a, an acute condition over the short term, is largely concentrated in the U.S. and Europe. So we don't have a global crisis. We have a world that's operating at at least two speeds, slow in the high-income world and rather fast in the developing countries, including this one. And that is basically a salutary fact. It means that the poor countries are narrowing the income gap with the richer countries. There is what we call convergent economic growth, and that on the whole is how it should be, because no region of the world should have any kind of monopoly on prosperity or on material well-being. The fact that the North Atlantic dominated the world economy for almost two centuries was a historical anomaly not a normal feature of the world, and it is an anomaly that is gradually coming to an end. And the rise of East Asia and Southeast Asia are the most pertinent facts of changing that long reality. The catching up of Asia, and especially China, uh, because of its size and therefore weight in the world economy, is certainly the most pertinent aspect of the global macro economy. And it's a deep trend and a trend that I believe is likely to persist. If it doesn't, probably everything else I'm going to say in my talk is wrong. <laughs> so if China collapses and stops growing, uh, you won't want to invite me back, but I have to come back to correct all the rest. Uh, but, uh, I do believe that we are on a at least if, a, albeit a bumpy road, but a bumpy path towards convergence, which I take to be a salutary aspect of the world economy. But it doesn't feel so good in the high income world. And the adjustments in the U.S. and Europe to this reality have not been smooth on the whole. And in fact, uh, this basic phenomenon isn't even recognized uh, in general, uh, as a dominant phenomenon in the U.S. Uh, so there's a lot of confusion about what's happening uh, in the U.S. economy. Almost all of the U.S. discussion is of a closed economy nature. Uh, and this is a legacy of uh, intellectual laziness and inertia, not of the current reality. Uh, so the whole U.S. crisis and European crisis are talked about uh, largely uh, as internal matters, not as part of the process of globalization. The second basic trend that I'll want to stress is the rapid pace of technological change. Now, part of that technological change is catching up uh, the adoption of improved technologies in places like Malaysia or China that 20 years ago were far behind the technological frontier and have narrowed the gap very substantially. But a lot of the technological change is true innovation, and it's largely centered around the digital revolution, which I believe is the most fundamental driver of change in the world, together with convergence. So the digital revolution is basically summarized by Moore's Law, uh, that's the statement that Gordon Moore made back in 1965, that the ability to concentrate transistors uh, in an integrated circuit was 
doubling every 18 to 24 months, and that it was likely to continue. And Moore's law can be restated in a variety of uh, related ways. The ability to capture information, the ability to process data, uh, and so forth. Since about 1958, that information revolution through digital technology has continued to improve at roughly a doubling every 18 to 24 months. If you take out your calculator and look at what that implies, it implies that over a period of roughly 54 years, we've had about a billion-fold improvement in the ability to store, process, and transmit data. A billion is a lot for technological change. It has revolutionized everything. Not only making phone calls or being able to stream movies on demand uh, or the internet, but it changes, in my view, and will increasingly change every aspect of our economies. How we produce and use energy, how we transport people and goods, how we use and design construction materials, how we fight pollution, how we educate children, how we address public health needs. I think we're relatively at the start of this transformation in those sectors because Moore's Law has had its greatest effect directly in computerization and in uh, communications, in the internet, in mobile telephony, and so forth. It hasn't yet penetrated uh, basic health care, for example, but it will through genomics and through uh, telemedicine and through telemetry in monitoring health. It will change education fundamentally. The fact that I'm giving a lecture right now and there's a room watching next door isn't necessarily so remarkable, but let me say hello to students next door. It's very nice of you to be watching on a screen. But what it also means is that it can be students anywhere in the world. And people watching uh, live on the internet are indeed doing that. Uh, and uh, as uh, Sulo Nader knows, because we've done it together, we've had uh, global classrooms together uh, for the last three years where students have participated in global lectures in a virtual classroom with 25 campuses around the world in the same discussion, <coughs> ranging from New York to KL to Beijing, Delhi, Ibadan, Nigeria, Mechale, Ethiopia, Trinity College, Dublin, Sciences Po, Paris, and so forth. Well, that's how education will be routinely in the coming years. The idea that we will simply sit in a lecture hall, as nice as this one is, uh, in its, uh, new, uh, with its new face, uh, will not be the dominant way that we learn. And so that's another way that Moore's Law will penetrate uh, the future economy. The third fundamental trend in the world, and I'll point out related to these two, but not uh, only by those two phenomena, is the widening inequalities within our societies and the riskiness of societies that feel uh, a great deal of change, flux, and inequality, and that need to find bases of legitimacy and a sense of fairness, shared justice, and faith in institutions to be able to handle all of this transformation. And it's not easy. And it's certainly not easy because another part of the change is very dynamic population change in many places in the world. So our numbers are rising quickly at a global scale still, even though the proportional growth of the world population has declined from over 2% in the early 70s to just 1% today. The absolute numbers of people rising on the planet are about 75 million per year. 
meaning that every dozen or so years another billion people have been added to the planet's population over the past generation and we're expecting another billion people by 2024 and another billion people after that by 2044. And this also is putting tremendous social strains because many of those people have very little economic prospect being born into very poor places and without the chances for economic development. So the income and wealth inequalities are a major third dimension of our situation. And the fourth very serious and unsolved aspect of our global reality is the rising natural resource scarcity and in some dimensions uh, outright economic environmental crisis that is a worldwide phenomenon. So we have a world that is converging because of